come to this concept of the quasar experiment. And I want to spend a bit of time now talking about this because I think very often one of the problems is that we can't do a true experiment. We'd like to, but we, we, we're not able to. Partly because you can't randomise properly, or it might be because you haven't got a lab available, or because people can't travel to the lab, or we simply you can't organise things in that kind of fashion either. So, but we'd like to better keep some of the power of the true experiment. The power of the true experiment is to be able to say something about what caused the difference in the outcomes, what the difference in the different variables. So we'd like to keep that power, we'd like to keep the strength of the, uh, the, the experiment, but we're not able to do, do it in the, in the proper fashion. And that's what the quasar experiment is trying to do. It's, it's called a quasar experiment because it looks like an experiment, but it isn't really, and it's missing certain key factors. And I'm basing this on the discussions by these classic works go right back some 40, 50 years ago. Um, Campbell and Stanley and Crook and Campbell, two books here. I, I should say, don't even think about reading those books unless you're a very, very, very hot statistician. They're quite heavyweight books, lots of stats in them and so on, which we should just put you off. But I thought I'd give you at least the sources so you know where it comes from. But I'm not recommending these readings to you. Read some other more simple things to begin with before you get into the, the, difficult, the, the tough stuff. So these are uh, rather tough books. But I will be using some stuff from them. Uh, they talk about some of the issues. In fact, um, you'll notice the handout I, I will use later, which I gave you in the previous week, um, the, the threats to internal validity, actually comes from uh, Cook and Campbell's book. Uh, they, they list some of those things. I think I gave the reference to it. Yeah, quasi representation. Um, so that, that comes from there. And also I'll be using later on today some of their designs that they talk about as well. So I've, I've taken things from those books um, to, to, uh, to structure the, the rest of this session. Now what is a quasar experiment? As I said, it looks like an experiment, but it really isn't. And the point is it has the general style and approach of experiments. So you have groups, uh, and you have treatments, and you have things you do to manipulations and, and, and measurements of things that you do, or recording of things, even if you're not measuring things, you can record them. Um, all of that's just like a true experiment, but the one thing that's missing from it is there's no randomised allocation of participants. So when you have two or more groups, you don't randomly allocate to those groups. Rather, those groups exist already, or they're picked in some other way. Very often they exist already, um, they're not, but they're not randomly allocated. So they're there, okay. So if you go into a school, the classes are there. So you might use different classes, your different groups. Then you'd be talking about a, a quasar experiment, because it might be an experiment in all kinds of other ways, but that one key factor. And of course, immediately that undermines the whole idea of the strength of the experiment to link the, the, the causes to the outcomes, um, and you can't do that. Nevertheless, and this is the, the importance of this work, I think, is that Cook and Campbell suggest that if you're careful how you do it, if you pick certain designs of experiment and not others, and at the same time you're careful about inspecting all the various threats to validity, things that might have gone wrong with what you're doing, things that might under, undermine your results, um, if you're very careful about that, then you can use these designs to say something about what is causing the effects that you discover. Um, so you can make some judgment about causal conditions on the basis of that. But you have to be very careful about that. The start is, is the ones to avoid. These are designs that Cook and Gamble suggest we should avoid under any circumstances. These are not experiments. They're not even proper quasi-experiments. Um, they're just too dangerous. What he mean by that is, is that that there's too much chance that we'll make false deductions about what's causing uh, the, the effects. So here is the, what they call the one group post-test only design. And you've got three stages or three events. You've got an experimental treatment group, just one group. That's, that's, a, that's a clue here. There's just one group, no control, one group. We do something to them. We treat them. We, we, we give them some kind of teaching or we... we put them into a loud noise or whatever, we give them some Mozart and so on, and then we observe what happens to them. We, we might kind of measure how much they're learning or we might measure their reaction times, all sorts of other things. Whatever we're doing at the end, we observe them. 
observation I use in a general sense. It could mean looking at them, it could mean talking to them. It very often means doing something where they get a test and you get a number at the end or some kind of measurement of things. Uh, so it can be numeric, but it doesn't have to be numeric. So we do we, we, we have the experimental group, have a group of people. <coughs> Remember, they're not randomly allocated, they're not randomly selected, they're just a group of people. That's a key point about the quasar experiment. We do something to them and then we see what happens. And of course, the result of this, which I hope you recognise now, is that we've got very little warrant any, any justification for any deduction of cause and effect. You know, what we observe something happens to them. How do we know that was caused by the treatment or whether it was caused by something else or whether it was some, some kind of something to do with the group themselves? Um, that, you know, we, we know nothing about this group. We've just got a group of people and we do something to them. Um, and then we observe something. Well, how do we know that that's because of our treatment? How do we know that's not because of the group of people themselves and what they're like or something else that happened to them in the meantime and so on? So this is just simply a bad design and, and, and we shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't do it. Now notice the experiment, you might say, hang on a minute, this looks like a survey to me. This looks like we've got a group, we've done, done something to them, given them a questionnaire, and then we observe the results. We go through and measure what they've done at the end, end of that. Isn't that, a, isn't that a survey? Well, the answer is yes, which is why in a survey we're so careful to make sure that the, the sampling is done properly. We're using random sampling or quota sampling or whatever. In this case, of course, that's not true. The experimental group has not been randomly selected, randomly allocated in any sense whatsoever. So we've not got that, that safety valve that we have in the, in the survey. So d- avoid this one, say Cook and Campbell. This might look so slightly better. We've got two groups now. We've got group X1, we've got group X2. So we've got two groups of people. Remember, again, they're not randomly allocated. They simply exist already or they've been picked in some other way. And one group gets the treatment, that's the T. Um, and one, one group either gets a different treatment or doesn't get a treatment at all. Um, it's the control group, if you like. Um, and then we observe both of them separately. We observe what happens to group one and we observe uh, uh, X1 and then we observe what happens to group X2. So we get observation two. And we see if there's a difference. We might expect there to be a difference. We might expect the results of O1, the observation of group 1, to be different from the observation of group 2 because they've had the treatment T done to them, had something done to them that's changed how they're going to behave. So that, that would be our expectation. But if we do find a difference, we can't be sure that it's the treatment that's made the difference. For example, there can be history effects on X1 only. Maybe X1 was a group. Let's imagine we're, we're doing this in the school and it turns out that X1 had a really good maths teacher in, in, before they did the experiment. And X, X2 had a whole range of, of, um, of supply teachers who they had no real relationship with at all and some of them were quite dodgy and so on. Uh, so they had very poor teaching beforehand. And then you give them this test and you're, you're trying some new technique of, of teaching with them uh, maths teaching and of course they do very well group well that's got nothing to do with your method that's surely to do with the fact that they had good teaching beforehand so x1 had good teacher and x2 didn't and of course this comes about because we haven't randomly allocated we simply picked two two groups that may have had some difference we, we, can, we can't tell beforehand so history effects might make a di- difference or it might be that O1 and O2 are done at different times. I mean, one might follow the other. X1 might be one done one month, X2 the next month. It may be the things that happen between those two points might make a difference to the two groups. Um, in some way. There can be mortality problems. And, of course, the term mortality, as I talked about in the case of surveys, mortality is used here not to be necessarily dying, or that can be, but it means people dropping out or people leaving in some way. Um, an example I've given here is the treatment causes more dropout than the, the control group does. So maybe there's something we're doing to people that means that, you know, that, that whatever it is we're doing, that treatment we're, we're carrying out causes them to drop out from the experiment more than the others do. And so that, that you know, gives rise to some kind of bias. Maturation problems. Again, this is true of, of school children. Imagine you did X1 um, at the beginning of the year and group X2 at the end of the year. So they'd be, you know, 11 months older um, uh, than, than, uh, than, they, than the X1s were. Well, you might expect different results. Children mature quite rapidly, and you might expect different results if a group is 11 months older than another group. <coughs> so again, that kind of maturity problem, or maturation problem, might be an issue. 
And of course, above all, it's the selection. X1 and X2 are different groups. So whatever has been done to select them... Again, it's not uncommon in schools, even today, to have them streamed in some way, to have a, a, one class that have been doing well in, in their exams and their tests, the bright kids, another class that isn't doing so well, and, and they're the not-so-bright kids. Um, and what if that was the case in this school? An, an X1 with the bright kids, an X2 with the not-so-bright kids. Again, you'd expect a difference because of that. You've got no control over that. This is not a, a true experiment. You're having to accept the groups as they are. And that selection of those two groups might affect your results. And so on those kinds of grounds, again, Crook and Campbell suggest that we, we don't use this design, that, that simply having um, you know, these, these, these two groups and one observation might not be a good thing to do. Third design, another variation on this. This time we have a before and after, but we only have one group. So we take some of the good things from the second example, having, uh, <coughs> um, but we, uh, um, sorry, from the first example, but we, 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 we lose some of the good things in the second example. So rather than having two groups to compare, we do look before and after. So this way we can say, we, can, we might think we're kind of eliminating the, the, the prior effects, the, the, we, the problem that we had in the, the second example. The, the groups might be different. So we, we have a group, we do something, oh sorry, we measure something, then we observe them in some way, we then do something to them, and then we observe them again, see how they changed. So this might be, I don't know, um, let's imagine we're, we're a psychologist experimenting on the effects of alcohol on, on, uh, on the ability to, to, to react when you're driving, so reaction time. Typically you might take a group of people, you observe them, so you measure their reaction times, you give them some, some driving type tests, maybe in front of a video um, image of, of, of a road and so on, you, you test how quickly they react to things, and um, there's some nice machinery that can measure it down to fractions of a second, the reaction time. Then you give them some alcohol, uh, make them drink a, a fixed amount each, and then you give them the test again. Um, and the same test you can do again, the same reaction times and so on. Um, and you can see whether their reaction times have slowed down. You might expect it to slow down. We know that happens. Um, okay, so is that a good experiment? Well, again, Crook and Campbell suggests no. The reason is because you've only got one group here. That all sorts of things can happen here with just one group. And we need some kind of control group as well alongside it. <coughs> so we might have test effects. Maybe doing the first observation or doing the first measurement might in some way prepare them for the second one. So back to my example of the road test. It might be that having gone through the video and watched all these things, you, you know, your reaction time is better because the second time round, <coughs> it's the same situation and you're, um, you're expecting things to happen. So your reaction time <coughs> it gets, it gets slower because of that. So there's some kind of test effect, something in the way you set the experiment up that, that, that means that the differences are... are um, are uh, caused by your experiment, not caused by the, the group themselves. There can be instrumentation problems, changing measurement scale um, from 01 to 02. Um, yes, it can be that, uh, the, that the way you're measuring things changes over time, that you learn, or maybe experimenters do things differently, or they, they, they apply things differently, or, or that you know, something in the way you, you're measuring things changes over time. It has nothing to do with the, the actual treatment, but something else is going on that causes the differences. And you can't tell if that's the case or not. But nevertheless, this is not an uncommon situation. I mean, I have to say, when you look through the published literature in the social sciences, you find this kind of design again and again and again. And I have to admit that I have published work that uses this design. So although Cook and Campbell say, try and avoid it, there can be reasons why you, you can, as I say at the end, despite the dangers, you can work around it in various kinds of ways to try to ameliorate, try to control some of those dangers in, in, the, um, in, the, in the design. I mean, so, I mean, I've done stuff based on, on uh, students' learning. So I've got a group of students, a class of students. I've measured them at the beginning of the year. I've done something to them. I've given them some teaching or some whatever it is, the technology I've used with them. And then I measure them at the end of the year. <coughs> now, I got around that to some extent by comparing it with other kinds of, of situations in other universities and other tests that have been done. So I, I knew the kind of things that typically happened 
to, to groups in that situation, although I didn't have a control group as such uh, to work with. Uh, so I could ameliorate that to some extent. Um, and of course, as, a, as before, that last point, as Cook and Campbell stress again and again, you have to look through and see if there are any possible threats. Can you think of anything that could have gone wrong uh, that might have caused the differences rather than the treatment that you were trying to uh, test out? And again, you, you can do that by going through the, the list of threats almost and, and checking them off. No, that didn't happen, that didn't happen. Oh, well, that might have happened. I'd be careful about that. See, I have to inspect that and see if that happened or not and, and look in the background. So it's better, but it's by no means a perfect design, and, and ideally you should be avoiding it if you possibly can. Which takes me to, um, let me just, oh yes, the regression effect, another danger here as well, um, which I had mentioned in the previous session, I think, I talked about regression in one of the earlier sessions, um, the regression to the norm I talked about then, um, how when you do a retest, uh, the chances are that the, the high performers will be slightly lower the next time round. And this is a real problem if you're, if you're selecting groups based upon some kind of pre-test. Now, this often, often happens in educational settings, uh, rare, more rarely, I think, in other settings, but in education very often we do that. We, we do some kind of pre-test, and then we pick people on the basis of that pre-test. So I've given an example here of a disadvantaged group as against a comparison group. The disadvantaged group might be some group disadvantaged in some way. It might be learning problems they've got, or it might be social disadvantage, or it might be they, they, they've had less you know, te formal teaching or something of this kind compared with the other group. Some other reason why they're disadvantaged. And then typically in this kind of design, you, you start to match them up, and you match them in terms of the scores. So we say we've got a match group. We do a pretest to, to see if we can match up the scores. So here I'm trying to indicate on my, my line across the top, my scale across the top, on the left-hand side, I've got the low scorers, the right-hand side are the high scorers. And the, 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 the ticks across the line indicate where the people came. The, the people across the top on the disadvantaged group are doing worse, on average, than the, the comparison group. Uh, they're more to the left. But we can pick up pairs of people who match. So we've got two groups now who have been matched in terms of their pre-test scores. We might think, actually, we've got a group comparison now. We've got two groups who, let's imagine it's, it's again, teaching mathematics and we're interested in, in our new method of teaching maths. So we look at their, their, their exam results from, the, from the, you know, the previous year. and We, we pick the two groups um, on the same exam and we pair them up. So one pupil from the disadvantaged group paired with one from the comparison group who had the same score, the same mark on the examination. Now the temptation here is when you redo the experiment, when you, when you, you run your experiment and you, 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 you re-measure uh, what's going on here, the, 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 the temptation is that we've got some kind of control here, we, we've got them a bit like random allocation really. The trouble is what we get is a regression to the mean, that those who were scoring high on the previous occasion will tend to score lower, even if it's a different test, but if it's in the same kind of area like mathematics, they will tend to score less well the second time round. And those who scored low the first time round will tend to score higher the second, on average the second time round. Some won't, but some will. What's going on here in, in any score that you get is a combination of a reflection of the underlying factors, your ability, for example, in doing whatever test it is, along with other factors that are, uh, in a sense, are issues of luck. You know, it was a good day that day. You had a good night's sleep and so on. And, and you know, you, you happened to revise the right kind of questions for the test and so on, things like this. All those kind of factors that, that might not happen the second time round. So there's the underlying ability, which is the main thing contributing to the score, and these other factors. And, of course, on the retest, those other factors change. So you might still be good, but you won't be quite as good. Or maybe you weren't terribly good the first time round, or you didn't get a good score the first time round, this time lucked with you, so you get a very good score, so it changes. But on average, those at the extremes would be those that had both good luck and a good underlying ability. So they're going to be the ones that tend to have a bit less good luck the second time round, and therefore they move back to the, the, the mean. So we get this kind of situation. Um, I'm not sure that diagram shows you very much at all. I think I might describe this a bit, bit complicated. But what I'm trying to show here is that from the top, 
that's the, the original pretest situation that people are moving to a I think two things to, to illustrate from this, that if you follow the dotted lines, that's the, the uh, disadvantaged group and where they end up. So they kind of move, some move up, some move down, they have slightly different scores. The control group, or the, the comparison group, is the second line down, they move to other scores as well, some of them good, some of them are less good, and so on. Overall, the pattern is the same. The second time round, the ones at the bottom, the disadvantaged group is still lower than the, than the comparison group, as you might expect. On average, that's what happens. But the individuals have moved such that the disadvantaged group actually end up doing um, uh, slightly worse than the comparison group. So it looks like we've got a difference, but actually it's simply because of this regression to the mean factor and what's going on. So the, the comparisons are regressed to their mean, which is a higher mean than the regression to the mean of the disadvantaged group. So if we did an experiment based on this, we'd find a result, but it would be a false result. It would be simply because of the regression to the mean. So again, another one to avoid. So you've got to be very careful to avoid those kinds of experiments. They could be able. Let me just finish with um, probably about... Um, 15 minutes worth of, of slides going through the, the approved versions of the, um, the designs that, uh, for quasi-experiments that Cook and Campbell come out with. So th these are not perfect. These are still quasi-experiments. So they're still subject to all kinds of problems that, that you know, is avoided by having this proper randomization to, to groups. Uh, but in some way they are better because we can start to see what's going on and make some... Um, deductions about what's happening uh, based upon the results. So here's the first design they suggest is a good one to use. Not perfect, but better than the others that I've talked about so far. And they call it the, the pre-test, post-test, non-equivalent groups design. So you can see it's a combination of, of effectively two of the situations we had in the previous ones. We've got now two groups, and we've got a before and after effect as well. So group X1 is observed then it's given the treatment and then it's observed again or it's measured then it's given the treatment and then it's measured again and we have a second group x2 that is observed and then they get something different they are the control group or they get a second treatment or whatever and then they're observed 04 and this is a much better design now we can begin to see if there are differences between the two groups that have had the treatment and those that haven't had the treatment we can see differences over time as well have changed. You know, so we might begin to eliminate some of those effects that are caused by the groups being different in the first place. You know, X1 is different from X2. But still there is a bias possible. We've still got that selection bias possible. It still may be the case that X1 is different from X2, that group X1 is group, different group X2 in some significant way. We haven't chosen them at random. But some other reason why they're in those groups might reflect. Maybe they're the ones who, who respond well to the treatment and the people in group X2 don't respond well or something like that. And that's why we get the different results we're getting. Still possibilities. We have to look into that. There might be, in fact, that's the, the treatment selection interaction I've just talked about. The, 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 the way we've selected the groups is, is, is in such a fashion that they respond well to treatment or don't respond well to treatment, one, one or the other. So we get the interaction. More importantly, Cook and Gamble suggest that the way we interpret the results here depends on the kind of outcome we get. And they give some charts which, which try to, to, to lay out the different results. So here's the first, of the first of those. We might get a result like this. And let me explain what this diagram is showing you. We've got the two time periods, the pre-test and the post-test here. So this is, to go back to the previous slide, 01 and 03 are the, the, the pre-tests and then 02 and 04 are the post-tests the, the observation or the measurement after we've given the treatment and the vertical axis the y-axis here is some kind of measure of, of what they did on average what that group was like so you can see both groups are fairly close together to begin with but the treatment group is scoring slightly higher to begin with then we give them the treatment and we test them again and we observe them again and the treatment group goes up quite a lot, and the control group doesn't go quite so much. It does go up, but not quite so much. So this might look like that we've found the difference. We've, the treatment has made a difference. The treatment has increased them more 
than the, the, uh, the control group. So the treatment has had some impact on them. But we have to be a bit cautious still because it might just be, for example, a, 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 an issue of measurement. Um, the, the scale of measurement up the, the, up the y-axis might be you know, not a linear scale. The fact that they both increased might mean that had the control group have been a higher score to begin with, and of course they're not randomly allocated, so we just don't know <laughs> whether that might be the case or not, uh, but they could have done, maybe they would have increased as well uh, as the treatment group have done. So that might be simply an effect of, of the, 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 the way the scales operate, they're non-linear scales. However, if we get a result like this, we've got a much stronger basis for our conclusions that the treatment made a difference. Here, the control, control group hasn't changed at all before and after the treatment, but the treatment group have. And in this case, we know it's not a scale effect because they've, they've not changed, so, so that can't be an issue. So we know that what's happened here is likely to be the treatment. There still might be all the other problems of bias and so on, I talked about earlier on. You have to inspect it for that to see if that's the case. But we have at least much better um, grounds for, for concluding that our treatment has caused the difference. And Cook and Campbell say even better is this situation. If the treatment group started off with a lower score, that or lower measurement than the control group and then at the post-treatment um, they get a much much bigger bigger score then we can be pretty sure that that it, you know it, the treatment has, has done something that's caused that difference to happen so we've got results that we can rely on much better not not perfectly but but much better okay a second design they suggest is a good one is this one and it's the interrupted time series um, and here we have, rather than just simply a couple of observations, we have lots of observations. So we might start with just one group, and we observe them over time. So we observe them once, twice, three times, four times, and so on. So 01, 02, 03 are a string of observations. I've got up to 04. And then the treatment is given to them, or something happens to them, or we do something. And then we observe them again over time. Once, and then a bit later, 06, a bit later, 07. 08 and so on. So we've got a whole string of observations. Um, and what we're doing here is looking for a change in the pattern. Now, um, the numbers don't quite agree, because I've actually got, what, one, two, three, four, I've got six points and then six afterwards rather than four and four. Sorry about that. But in the diagram, I've tried to indicate time is across the x-axis from left to right. So on the far left is the first observation, then the second, the third, and so on. So we, we go across here, here as time goes on and here's the treatment point here's where we give the treatment t and then we observe them again going across the, the period after that and what you can see here is if you get this result you can be pretty sure something has happened they you know on average they will you know the figures are changing a bit these these are average figures for the for the group you know they didn't change that much until the treatment happened and then they suddenly shot up and they carried on afterwards being high that's good evidence that the treatment made a difference. It's pretty solid. It's not absolutely sure, because we didn't randomly allocate it, but nevertheless, if you found something like this and it was this clear cut, you'd say, actually, that treatment did make a difference. It caused the, the, the observations or the scores to change in that significant fashion um, after the treatment. So if you get a result like that, you've got a really good result. But it isn't always that clear cut. Sometimes you have this kind of result, you, the same before the test, then you give the test and it starts increasing and it carries on increasing. Again, you might say this gives you good reason for thinking the treatment has had an impact. It's a cumulative impact, it's getting better each time afterwards rather than a step upwards, but nevertheless it's a clear-cut effect and again good evidence that the, the treatment has had that effect on, on, on the respondents. But we had to be a bit careful because we might get this situation and here we can see that they're, they're getting better all the time as they go this might be a maturation issue for example they're, they're getting better as they go through the time um, the treatment seems to have had no particular effect it has made no kind of change on that gradual kind of increasing score as we go through time but of course if you just do a bit of statistics on this you'll find that the mean score before the treatment will be about here somewhere and the mean score after treatment up here somewhere so there'll be differences the mean score before and after treatment is different 
but when you inspect the, the actual chart here you see that's that's a false perception that actually there's no evidence that the treatment has had any impact whatsoever so if you're doing a continuous uh, this kind of repeated measures kind of uh, of experiment then it's important to look at the graphs to look at the, the figures across all the different observations to see if you've got this situation because here there's no evidence of, of treatment having any impact and we might even get this complicated situation this is not unusual as well in these time series things to find that you get a kind of what's often called a premature effect that the change appears to happen before the treatment um, so you've got a, a fairly steady situation here and then it starts going up before the treatment happens on this ground you might say well actually it wasn't the treatment it was something else that happened that caused that change to go on rather than the treatment and therefore you've got no evidence that the treatment has had that causal impact something else and it's sometimes quite subtle it's not obvious you know that, that that's happening if i um if i were to, to cover up half the the, the, the diagram it wouldn't be obvious from just the the pre-treatment figures that that was going to happen so close inspection is quite important to see just in case there have been any of these premature effects um, or even the other around i suppose a kind of a a, a, a a late effect an effect happening after the treatment but but well after the treatment um, can't be uh, uh, used either so inspecting the charts and again this is an important point about looking at quasar experiments is looking at the results you get in various ways in particular using charts here to look at the results it's quite a useful way of checking that you've got a valid result or, or a result you can rely on more than you can do otherwise the last one um, is uh, a slightly more complicated one but uh, quite an interesting one the regression discontinuity design and this relies on the kind of results you get from doing a, a correlation of, of two variables. And the idea is that um, you know, when you do a correlation, you normally get a spread of results. You get you know, some people lo scoring low, some people scoring high, and you get a spread of those results. And if you do it twice, before and after, then you'll get some kind of relationship. Those who scored low to begin with, other things being equal, will tend to score low afterwards and those that scored high to begin <coughs> with will tend to score high afterwards other things being equal so if you do nothing at all you, 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 you get some variation of course so you get a cloud of results but you get a kind of line of results the low ones staying low the high ones staying high and the ones in the middle staying in the middle roughly speaking some movement about but not a great <coughs> deal now the the discontinuity design looks basically splits that, that, that range of people in the, uh, the pretest into two groups those who scored low to begin with and those who scored high now you might say immediately what about regression effects here this is a this is a problem here well the whole point about this is it uses that kind of randomization in, in the regression effect to to to, to overcome this um, and what, what what it does is then do a retest and then displays the chart of results that 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 cloud of results to see whether there's been a shift in the results so below sc those scoring low at some point on a pretest uh, are separated and, and not giving a treatment and those who score high on the pretest say are given a treatment um, and then we see whether that's made a difference to their results and what we're looking for is a discontinuity and you get this kind of discontinuity in the results so with, with the chart here is a kind of display of the pretest results across the, the x-axis here um, left to right and the post-test is the vertical axis the y-axis um, and as you might expect there's a kind of randomization these are individuals so this person here scored the lowest score on the post-test but the second lowest on the pretest that one scored the the lowest on the pretest score but in fact they were about what one two three about fourth lowest on the post-test so the tendency as you can see because there's a kind of line of results there's a tendency for the pretest those who scored low on the pretest to score low on the post-test and likewise those who scored high in the pretest to score higher on the on, on the post-test not absolutely otherwise it'd be a straight line uh, but the kind of cloud results the interesting point is the the group that scored high on the pretest that's the ones who come up here who were given the treatment and in this case they've all lifted up a bit so they've all scored better than they might expect it to be otherwise on the post-test so all their results have been pushed up the diagram a bit 
that, that, that distance, that discontinuity is the, approximately the distance they've been moved up. And this is a quite a powerful test. There's no random allocation here, so it's not a true experiment. But nevertheless, um, we can tell on the basis of this that, that there's, there's strong evidence that the, the treatment did have an effect. It had the effect of pushing up the results of the, the high-scoring groups in the way you can see on the diagram here. Now, it's not always as clear as this, but if you get this kind of clear result, you've got good evidence, even though it's not a true experiment, you've got good evidence suggesting that the treatment did have the impact. Okay, um, so there's some good designs. Let me just finish with a few comments about, you know, the overall um, use of experiments and, and, and of quasi-experiments in, in social research. As I said, I've emphasised that it's, it's quite difficult to, to run field experiments, but not impossible. Um, we've got one or two examples of those to, to look at. And in fact, the one you've been doing for the assessment is a, a field experiment. Um, and that's why we think about quasi-experiments as, as a way to do things, as a way of try to, trying to get to grips with the fact that we can't properly randomly allocate in the field, but we want to be in the field because it's important to be there. So we may need to think about other designs um, to do that. I think these are quite useful. I mean, you might think of experiments as, as lab things, the kind of things you do in physiology and psychology and so on, and that's, that's the kind of way. That, and and don't, don't apply to many areas of, of life. Well, in fact, they can apply to many areas and more areas than you might think. Um, we can use quasi-experimental-like designs in a wide range of fields. I've got a couple of examples to mention here, um, if I can remember the details properly. One is, um, it was actually a column in The Guardian called Bad Science, uh, written by Ben Goldacre, who's, um, I think he's taking some time out at the moment to write another book. But he looks at, you know, the results of... of um, various kinds of scientific experiments and journal papers and things like this in various areas to see whether they're done properly or not and, and kind of reveals all the kind of problems with, with scientific method and, and, and that come up. I mentioned some of his work in a previous session when I talked about the impact of um, knowing who funds research on how you make judgments about the research. In fact, his latest book is on that very factor of, you know, what if the medical research we're, be, we're using uh, is being funded by the, the drug companies and so on. That, that changes our view of, of, of that research. In fact, to some extent, changes the results we get as well, it, it turns out. Ben Goldacre is the man. So he want his, uh, he's got a couple of books out now, but uh, so Ben Goldacre <coughs> has been writing this. This particular experiment is a natural experiment. He was, um, if I get this right, um, yes, it, the, the point was, do academic papers that get mentioned in the newspapers, in the popular press, so to speak, do they get a higher impact factor? Do they get read by more other academics? I don't know if you know about this, but in, in journals, there, there is a measure of how often they're cited, and that's called the impact factor. So if your journal paper is cited by lots of other papers later on, it has a high impact factor because it's been quoted a lot by other papers. A low impact factor is one that's not quoted very much at all, or, or not at all, um, in which case it's a low impact factor. Now, the, the thing being raised here was, does being talked about in the media, you know, if your paper gets, you know, into the, the headlines on the papers or gets into the, the 10 o'clock news or whatever on the TV, does that make a difference to imp its impact factor? And what happened was a kind of natural experiment here. Um, what you really want to do is to have, you know, one set of papers that is, you know, hidden away from the media, another set that isn't hidden away. So we've got two randomly allocated groups, one randomly allocated group of papers that don't get into the media at all because we hide them away, another group that, that aren't hidden, and then we can see if there are any differences. But of course we can't do that, it's just impossible to do that. What happened here was a natural experiment, and in fact it, it occurred because the, um, I think, was it the Sunday, the, the Times, or, um, no, it was the New York Times, sorry, American paper, New York Times, the, the journalists went on strike um, and the papers weren't published. <laughs> or maybe it was the production people on strike. Anyway, for whatever reason, the paper wasn't published. But because it's a paper of record as such, they still wrote the articles. Um, but of course, nobody read them because they weren't published. So they had all the details there. So it was a kind of natural experiment. For a certain time, this paper um, 
mentioned these, 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 these journals and they talked about them, but of course nobody knew about it because it wasn't published. So we could, we got an actual experimental group here. We've got the period beforehand where the paper was being read. People did know that, you know, certain publishers, certain um, journal publications were, were, were interesting and so on. And we had a period when they still knew which ones it was because they wrote them, but nobody read it. And then we got back to normal and then back, back to work again. What they did was compare those two groups. So we could know the papers that had been mentioned in the paper and look at those and see what their impact factors were. And then we could look at the period when they were on strike, when again we knew which, which journal papers they were looking at because they wrote the, wrote the articles, but they were never published in the paper because the paper didn't come out. Uh, so nobody knew about it. And we compare those. So we had a natural experimental group and a, and a control group, if you like, uh, in, in this situation. And of course, what they found interesting was it does make a difference. Um, interestingly, the number of times you get mentioned in the media, in this case in the New York Times, had an impact on the impact factor that other academics were, were taken in, if you like, by this to, to read the papers more and cite them more. Interesting result. But the important point for our purposes is the natural experiment, that period when nothing was actually being published in the paper meant you had a, a control, if you like, where nobody was reading them compared with the group beforehand where they were reading them. Another example which I came across some years ago is, um, in fact, I found the paper. It's, it's Graham, Graham Farrell and John Thorne, uh, two criminologists. And Graham Farrell now, now is at Loughborough University, a professor there. And they'd done quite a lot of work back in the um, uh, 1990s, I think it was, in Afghanistan. This particular paper is a, a kind of, of um, repeated measures design. Um, they, they looked at the, the figures in Afghanistan for opium production. So this was going using United Nations figures. United Nations keeps records of, of how much opium is produced over a period of time. So over several decades, they looked at opium production. And they said, well, what has made an impact? What, is, what has caused a change in, in, in opium production? It's a big problem because it's a major source of, 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 of opium um, and heroin is, is Afghanistan. So a big problem for the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> and what they discovered was that the thing that made the big impact, if you like, there was a series of, here was opium production quite high, or for you, your, it was quite high up here, and suddenly it went down. And it carried on low, and then it went back up again. And what happened during that period when it went down? A bit like this graph suddenly changing. There was a natural experiment went on here. Not one that we caused. It's not a, you know, we didn't manipulate it. What happened was the Taliban took over. And the result of their paper is they suggest that if you want, to, you know, almost if you want to cure heroin, get the Taliban back. Because um, what happened was that the, 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 the amount of heroin being produced was quite high and suddenly... The, 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 the Taliban took over, imposed new laws. I mean, not, not nice laws. They were pretty strict and pretty violent about how they imposed them. But the heroin production went right down. And then when they were, were thrown out again, the heroin production went back up again. So kind of natural experiment over a period of time here where the, the treatment was, was the country being taken over by the Taliban. Now, I'm not suggesting that we deal with the heroin problem by having the Taliban in charge because it wasn't a nice period for, for the Afghanistan farmers. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's a nice example of how that kind of thing happening in the world can give you this kind of natural experiment that you can then use in a time series approach. So you can use these, these features in research designs in a variety of different ways. Um, and it's always worth doing so, but you always have to consider the threats to validity, the things that might have happened that might cause you to get effects that, that, uh, that aren't really justified by your experience. Mm -hmm.